How's it going, everybody? My name is Caden. You might recognize me from the Lab Padre live streams. And this week at Starbase, SpaceX launched their 11th Starship test flight, bringing the V2 phase of the Starship program to an end. With the V3 program now getting started, we must ask ourselves two questions. Was SpaceX able to complete all of the test objectives of this latest flight? And how soon do we think crews will get to work reconfiguring Pad 1 for future Starship launches? To answer these questions, let's dig into this week's update and find out. We start with a little bit of a backtrack. Two days before the launch of Flight 11, Starship 38 was moved out of Mega Bay 2 and began its rollout to the launch pad, stopping in its usual place next to the launch mount for the final time. Ship 38 was then stacked on top of the reflown Booster 15, completing the stack for the final launch from Pad 1. Well, this configuration of it anyway. Launch day began with the usual flow of preparations, and following the road closure, the chopsticks were moved into the launch position, and the pad was cleared. Working to make sure the area was clear, a range support helicopter buzzed the cameras and the build site while heading out for patrol. The Pad 1 launch tower and launch mount both began their line conditioning vents at the scheduled time in the count, and a few minutes later, propellant loading began, and the vehicle was rapidly filled with roughly 5,000 tons of liquid oxygen and liquid methane. As the countdown to launch finally reached zero, with the screech of the high-pressure gas, the deluge system activated, and Booster 15's 33 engines ignited as it lifted off from Pad 1 for the final time and ascended into the South Texas skies. Thanks for all the memories, Pad 1. Following a nominal 33-engine full-duration burn and ascent, 30 of Booster 15's engines shut down for hot staging, followed by ignition of Ship 38's six engines. Booster 15 flipped and performed its boost back burn on 12 of the 13 inner engines and headed back towards the coast. The booster successfully brought itself to a hover with a simulated Block 3 landing burn, going from 13 down to 5 and finally to 3 engines, before shutting down 200 meters in the air and splashing down, or more accurately, impacting the water. Meanwhile, dropping down from six engines to three and finally zero, Ship 38 successfully completed its ascent to a suborbital trajectory, with multiple tests planned for this launch ahead of the flight of the first V3 vehicle. The Starlink dispenser was used to deploy another eight satellite simulators, and just like last flight, this test was passed with flying colors, with all eight passing straight out of the bay and into space, without the twists and bumps that we saw on Flight 10. The ship also successfully performed a relay test, the third for the Starship program, demonstrating its deorbit burn capability for future orbital flights. And despite leaving out the heat shield tiles and ablative backing material in the highest heat areas of the ship, Ship 38 passed through re-entry with literal flying colors, performing a high mock dynamic banking maneuver to simulate a catch tower approach before successfully performing a landing burn and soft splashdown in the Indian Ocean. With the successful conclusion of the flight, workers returned to the pad about an hour after launch and began post-flight operations. Decommissioning work began on Pad 1 the next day, with crews venting off the pad's CO2 storage and purging the booster quick disconnect interface as well as the propellant lines on the tower. Now, no further launches are planned from this Pad 1 launch mount, so it will be demolished. The work platform was brought back to the build site, where it will likely be scrapped. The chopsticks on Tower 1 were then raised up to the ship quick disconnect level, before being lowered back down the next day. The ship quick disconnect arm was swung back in a bit later. Now, back at the build site, crews were busy moving multiple test tanks in and out of the Star Factory. Test article Ship 39.1, recently assembled inside Mega Bay 2, was lifted off the turntable and taken into the factory, and a new lifting jig was brought inside the bay. Inside Star Factory's assembly hall, the scaffolding was taken down from around the nose cone of Starship 39, the first V3 ship. A ship lifting jig was brought into Mega Bay 2, ready to begin assembly of that ship. And amid the equipment shuffle, the Starlink loader and installation jig were brought into the bay, near one of the right side work stands. With the bay prepared, Starship 39's nose cone was rolled out of Star Factory, giving us our best look yet at the V3 payload bay section. Now, most of this section's design is surprisingly largely unchanged from V2, save for a cleaner tile profile and the docking interface hardware for ship-to-ship -ship propellant transfers. Starship, as we all know, is designed to refuel in orbit, which will let it travel anywhere in the solar system. Also leaving Star Factory was a test article, which stopped by the ring yard before being sent to McGregor. 
it may be a structural load testing article for the propellant transfer tube used on the V3 Super Heavy. A V3 booster's forward dome and hot staging truss section likely for booster 18 was moved from the Star Factory to Mega Bay 1 for stacking. If we take a closer look at the upper dome, we can see that the top section has been reinforced with doubling plates underneath Starship's engines, which will protect the upper pressure dome of the methane tank during ignition and hot staging. A few hours later, a barrel section for the booster's methane tank was brought out and taken to Mega Bay 1 for assembly. Now back in Mega Bay 2, Ship 39's nose cone was lifted over and attached to the Starlink dispenser hardware we saw earlier. The lift and chain drive system is designed to eject the new V3 Starlink satellites one at a time. Once installed, the ship was moved over to the right-hand side of the bay while the dispenser installation stand was taken back to Star Factory. Chip 39 was brought out to the door again a few hours later, giving us a look at the dispenser's chain drive, which pushes the satellites out the door. Now taking a look at other construction at the build site, the four tower cranes that will assemble the Giga Bay need some help getting started, and a 300-ton capacity crane was brought in to do just that. Over the course of two days, the crane was fully assembled, cables were reeved, and the boom was raised, ready to begin work. Now with the new supporting crane in service, the tower crane assembly began to speed up, Additional tower segments were put in place, followed by the slewing ring. The mobile crane was then modified with a fixed jib, perhaps for the next phases of tower crane assembly, and the cable reel for the first tower crane arrived at the build site the following morning. Amid the work on that first tower crane, workers began stacking tower segments for the second of the four cranes. Plans apparently changed with the LR-1300 crane, with crews taking off the jib before putting on 6 and 12 meter segments for the main boom. At the same time, workers began assembling one of the tower crane masts. The mast is functionally analogous to the A-frame on the crawler cranes. After the crane was reconfigured, the jib was loaded onto a truck, and the main boom was raised to resume its work. Making use of the crane's greater reach, the cab of the first crane was lifted and set into place on the slewing ring. Moving down Highway 4 back to the launch site, fabrication work at Pad 2 continued with more cladding added to the pad side bunker. Several flex hoses were installed on the booster quick disconnect housings, bringing the pad closer to readiness. Shielding panels were brought to the launch site, where it looks like they'll be installed over the water cooling manifolds for the launch pad's upper deck. The liquid oxygen booster quick disconnect mechanism was also put through a battery of extension and retraction tests. With Flight 12 scheduled to fly from pad 2, the race is on to bring the pad into service. Moving on to Falcon 9 launches this week, SpaceX had some difficulties with flight support operations for the Project Kuiper KF-03 mission. A shortfall of Gravitas was sent out to replace Just Read the Instructions following several days of weather-related delays. The mission successfully lifted off on the 13th, carrying 24 satellites for Amazon's Project Kuiper constellation into orbit. Both fairing halves, as well as Booster 1091, were successfully recovered. Booster 1091's offloading from a shortfall of Gravitas used improvements to the unloading process to set the booster on the dockside stand with greater precision, making it easier on the ground teams that previously had to force the booster into alignment on the stands. SpaceX also launched another round of Starlink satellites this week, lofting another 28 satellites into orbit on Falcon 9 Booster 1095 from Slick 40. The recovery ships just read the instructions, and Doug supported the mission. Now across the country at Vandenberg Space Force Base in California, Falcon 9 Booster 1093 launched the Space Development Agency's Tranche 1 Transport Layer C mission, carrying a batch of low-orbit communication satellites for the U.S. military. The booster successfully landed on Of Course I Still Love You. In other space news, NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory announced the layoff of 550 employees this week as part of an ongoing restructuring effort at the agency. In the announcement, JPL Director Dave Gallagher stated the layoffs were necessary to create a leaner infrastructure while maintaining a tighter focus on core technical capabilities and budgetary streamlining. Impulse Space unveiled their proposed lunar mission architecture. Launching on top of a carrier rocket, a kick stage known as Helios would send the lander into a translunar injection, with the lander performing a braking and landing turn on the lunar surface. Across the pond in New Zealand, Rocket Lab successfully launched their Owl New World mission on Tuesday, carrying the seventh Strix Earth Observation Satellite for Synspective, a space-based imaging company located in Japan. Relativity Space released a program update video for their Terran-R rocket detailing progress as of September 2025. 
19 major component-level critical design reviews have been completed across the vehicle, and development and testing of their avionics hub box and vibration acceptance testing is well underway. Initial engine flight testing is also in progress, as is the acceptance and stress testing of the vehicle's primary load-bearing thrust structure. These tests, according to Relativity, will verify readiness for flight loads, transporter erector loads, and static fire hold-down loads of up to 3.7 million pounds, peaking at 478,000 pounds in one hold-down arm. Their horizontal integration facility down in Cape Canaveral is also coming along, with cladding installation now underway. The Department of the Air Force approved SpaceX's proposal for doubling the number of annual launches from Vandenberg, increasing from 50 up to 100 launches a year, and adding Falcon Heavy capabilities to Space Launch Complex 6, the former home of the Delta IV Heavy. Assembly of the massive Liber LR-13000 crane at LC-39A continued with the raising of its derrick for the first time this week, as SpaceX works to bring the Starship pad into service at the historic launch complex. The Orion spacecraft was brought to the Vehicle Assembly Building for integration with the Space Launch System rocket ahead of the Artemis II mission, currently scheduled to launch sometime in early 2026. Finally, VAST announced that it's running mission simulations for their upcoming Haven Demo launch, a 500kg demonstration satellite at their Mission Control Center in Long Beach. The demonstration mission will test key systems for their upcoming commercial space station architecture. And that should do it for this week's rather eventful space update. If you want to keep in touch with everything going on in the space world, be sure to stay tuned here at Lab Padre. With that, we will see you next week. Lab Padre, out.